frozen treats. I don't think anyone ever tried them and thought, you know, pass. Desserts tend to be over the top. Ubiquitous. You can't go into a bodega without there being an ice cream freezer right there. And anywhere in the world, you're always going to have that. They were marvels. So they happen to also be delicious, and we still love them and eat too much of them. They're so cool to bring out in front of a crowd of people. Frozen desserts have been around for a long time, uh, ever since you know, man discovered snow, probably. Don't you want to eat snow? I, I want to eat snow. I mean, it, in the sense, it's, it's snowing, and you, you want to put your tongue out, and you want it to fall on your tongue. I think there's accounts of the Chinese being the earliest. Give credit to the Chinese for a lot of things. I'm Chinese, so <laughs> I'm more than happy to share that credit. Frozen desserts are very much, or were very much, a treat only for the super rich. Like, you had to be an emperor in order to get some sort of shaved ice treat. A rocket pop back then would have been like the ultimate status symbol. Obviously we think now of, of the luxury of refrigeration and access to a freezer as being commonplace, but there was a very long time, in fact the majority of civilization, uh, where that did not, uh, that did not happen. The Silk Road brought a lot of technology from Asia to the Middle East. Don Derma, Turkish ice cream, has got this elasticity to it. It looks like taffy. And what gives it that effect is this kind of gum, um, usually naturally occurring gum, but uh, gum arabic, um, gum tragacanth. If you brushed your teeth this morning, you had some of that gum tragacanth in your mouth. It's everywhere. It's kind of ingenious to think to add a gum to an ice cream. Kulfi is Unlike any ice cream we, we know in the West, because it's not airy. It's, it's a little bit different because we don't, uh, you don't churn the ice cream prior to freezing. It's more like in that sense a semifredo, which is a mousse that's frozen. Whenever people from one part of the world migrate, invade, move to another part, they always bring their food and their culture with them. What we have here, it's kulfi faluda. It was brought from Persia. It's actually topped with tapioca noodles and uh, chia seeds, rose syrup, and a milk and cardamom reduction. There's actually a story about a Mughal ruler not having teeth. He was the one who commissioned his chef to transform the ice cream dessert in such a way that he can have it. We don't have summertime in Indonesia. There are only two seasons, raining or hot. Normally, we eat when there's very hot, weather, you know, so when you eat it, it's like headache. There's so many versions of basically the same thing, which is a shaved ice with uh, sugar syrup and fruit or other items placed on top and mixed together. The list is kind of endless. Bao Bing, Es Kampur, Halo Halo. Look at desserts like Halo Halo, which essentially just means mix, mix. In the Philippines, Halo Halo is the most ubiquitous dessert, and how can it not be? It's so hot out there. America's version is a sundae, Filipino version is a Halo Halo. Mix, mix is such an interesting word. Not only does it represent Filipino and Filipino culture in all of our influences, but the dish itself is a, a cultural mashup. We get halo halo from the Japanese version that um, came to the Philippines during the Japanese invasion. The most wealthy in the Philippines would have ice shipped on a large boat from Boston. I think the new modern techniques of using shaved ice, especially like Taiwanese style, is the ice is no longer ice, the ice is now flavored. So you'll see things like a milk ice that's being shaved. We really wanted something that was kind of a hybrid between ice cream and shaved ice. Being Sue kind of feeds into our human need for showmanship. It allows people to go nuts in the sense of it's that smorgasbord, it's that freedom of choice, it's everything under the sun. One of the most simple and delicious frozen desserts I can think of is actually more of a dumpling than it is anything else. You take mochi ice cream, for instance, that has been wrapped in, in rice and the frozen filling in the center is usually ice cream. What's interesting about mochi is that every facet of Japanese life involves rice. You know, there's always that Western influence, but there's always that, you know, Japanese kind of end note. If you've lived your whole life on you know, American ice pops, and you suddenly have a really just tried and true Mexican paleta. It's like, I kind of would equate that to, you've eaten nothing but canned pineapple your whole life, and all of a sudden, someone presents you with like, 
perfect, fresh, ripe, cut pineapple. It's sort of the same thing, but Jesus Christ, it's like a complete revelation. Paletas in Mexico, nobody really makes them because you have a store that has so many selections, but when I started making paletas, people would come up to me all the time. Our paleta machine is called Leti, and we love her. First ice cream trucks didn't have refrigerator units in them, no freezer units in them. They would have a giant steel plate in there that had been frozen. You can smear it out and it's not gonna melt, and you end up with that, that same, since it's so cold, uh, the same sort of extra creaminess from having the smaller ice crystals. Dessert in general are not a necessity in life. They're always usually served in moments of celebration or to cap a meal or something of a note of pleasure, right? You think about all the movie scenes you see with ice cream cones and people that generally people are happy and they're celebrating a moment or enjoying a day and it's a happy thought. I remember going to, to India Gate with my girlfriend uh, to get kulfi when we were in college together. So that brings very fond memories and uh, it is one of those things that really puts a smile on your face.